everyone, welcome back to Finance Friday on the ARC UK YouTube network. I'm Hard Money Jim, speaking today from uh, Coronado, California. However, last week, uh, I was back in Jackson Hole to be with a family member who had to undergo a medical procedure. And everything went well, by the way, thank you. Uh, but while we were there at our house, we had an unusual visitor on the back fence, and here he or she is. Now, we have a lot of bald eagles in the area, but they normally stay closer to the rivers and lakes. Uh, however, the water is frozen now, so this smart bird is adapting to a drier landscape. Uh, it stayed in this position on our back fence for hours, you know, vigilant for movement out there on the big prairie. And every now and then he'd fly off to pick up a snack and then he'd come back to perch and wait for, for some more. And, and to me, it was a perfect metaphor for what we all need to do in this new era of financial repression, because we need to adapt to a new landscape. We need to be smart. We need to be patient. And uh, that's what I'd like to talk about today. So we've been discussing financial repression and how it comes into existence. But today, I want to discuss what to do about it. That is to provide some general direction for saving and investing in an era of, of uh, higher inflation and low real interest rates. As regular uh, subscribers would know, um, here at Hard Money Gym, we're mainly interested in money creation and its consequences. So why am I talking about financial repression? We should ask, what is the connection between money creation and financial repression? And that connection is uh, what I've been establishing in the la last two podcasts. So just to bring everyone up to date, let's really just skim over it and reprise the connection between money creation and today's economic predicament that we, we find ourselves in. And I'm just going to make five connected points in bullet form. There's a lot you could say about each of these points, a lot, but I'm just going to make it in bullet points. First, uh, modern money is produced by pure credit creation in the commercial banks. Uh, and that's how virtually all the money uh, uh, is created. Even the paper dollars that you, you, that you stuff under your mattress and carry in your pocket actually originate as pure credit creation. Uh, point two, money creation in a free market is generally productive while money, create, money created uh, under government influence is generally unproductive and inflationary. Um, you know, money created under a free market uh, also creates goods and services that balance out the, the additional money and there, that comes into existence. And therefore, the uh, money creation is not, it's productive because it generates new wealth and it's not inflationary because you don't have the problem of too much money chasing too few goods. On the other hand, that's not true with government money production, which generally prints money for unproductive purposes. Now, point three, the government's abuse of money production uh, is a major cause of the government's level of unpayable debt, which we spend the last two uh, podcasts talking about. Uh, we are at a point where annual receipts, uh, tax receipts, no longer cover the government's mandatory spending requirements, plus the interest that they have to pay on existing debt. And this is obviously unsustainable. Okay, point four, the government's solution to this debt dilemma that they're in is financial repression. That's a combination of high price inflation and interest rates suppressed below the level of price increases. So high inflation will raise nominal tax revenues, while suppressed interest rates will hold down the government's interest costs. And the combination of these two allows the Treasury to pay down its debt in depreciated dollars. We detailed this last time and the time before. Finally, point five to bring us up to today. Final repression will alter the investment landscape. Just like that eagle is looking at a new landscape, Financial repression is 
uh, is going to require a different investment approach than what's been required in the last 20 years. That's the subject of today's discussion. Today, uh, we'll define the new investment landscape and outline our approach to investing under financial repression. So to reprise where we are in one sentence, the government's ability to control money production has hindered real wealth creation, and it's encouraged politicians to borrow irresponsibly, resulting in a level of debt so high that, it, that this debt can only be replay, repaid by implementing financial repression. That's a combination of high, high inflation and low real interest rates. So today's task is to discuss what financial repression means to you, and what you can do about it. And first I wanna discuss what I, I'm calling the investment landscape. That's the general contours in the land of available savings and investment options, and how this landscape is changing from sort of green hills and flowing rivers to a dry, rough desert. Now you can still make that desert bloom. You can, but it will take more work and sort of different survival techniques than the more lush investment landscape in the last few decades. Under the old investment paradigm, you could, you, you, in other words, you could drill a well almost anywhere and find water. But in the new one, you're going to have to know where to drill. So, uh, so first, let's examine this new investment landscape, and then, based on our understanding of it, we'll under, we'll uh, narrow the field down a little bit and discuss how to approach just a general approach to saving and investing. And the message is going to be that despite the bleak reality of moving from you know, green rolling hills to the desert, the news is not all bad because you can still prosper under these conditions if you're willing to change and adapt, like my friend the eagle. Now, uh, what is this new investment landscape going to look like under financial repression? Uh, first, I, I, I want to stress that any changes in the investment landscape is always a gradual process. It's almost imperceptible, like the uh, you know the multi-year movement of a glacier. It's very hard to notice if you're looking at it for signs of it day to day. And most people will not notice uh, you know, the changes uh, as it descends on because it is so gradual. Um, it reminds me very much of a great story I heard a couple of years ago. You probably have heard it. Uh, it's from a writer who's now deceased. The story goes, two young fish are swimming along one day and they, uh, they happen to meet an old fish swimming the other way. The old fish nods at the two young fish and says, good morning, boys, how's the water today? And then they all continue along their respective paths for a while. And then one young fish, fish looks over at the other and he says, hey, what the hell is water? So a few of us stop to notice the water that we're swimming. Um, by, by investment landscape, I'm, I'm talking about all the economic conditions that, that affect financial outcomes. These conditions include a complex mix of uh, political, social, psychological experiences, and so forth that heavily influence everyone's financial decisions. And this landscape uh, includes the widely held beliefs and operating systems of savers and investors, and it includes the actions of those investors that that then have a reflexivity back on to create other economic conditions. For example, as we'll discuss shortly, uh, the investment landscape is now changing from one that favored passive investing to one that will favor active investing. And I suspect most people are not noticing that. So my point is just as the young fish don't notice the water that they're swimming in, few people appreciate uh, that we've been in a long era a long secular era of declining interest rates, expanding money and credit, high and, ri high and rising asset pr prices, and all the speculative excesses that accompany such periods. Today's investors learn to swim in that water. So they may not understand that those conditions are not normal, and they may be slow to notice that their environment is changing. Now, incidentally, uh, the opposite happened to me uh, I started investing during a period of persistently high inflation, high and rising interest rates, civil unrest, popular war, unpopular wars, and so forth. And it was not obvious to me when that environment, you know, began to change. And it took a long time before I eventually caught up. 
So uh, try to understand the kind of water you're swimming in and don't take it for granted that the world you grew up in uh, is permanent or is the world you live in now. Now, uh, again, I, I don't want to overstate this because in many ways the world will look similar to how it's always been. You know, life will go on, we'll still get up, go to work, raise families and talk about the latest Netflix series and so forth. But um, in this world of, uh, you know, new and higher uh, investment or new and higher uh, interest rates and uh, low, low real rates and higher inflation, there are going to be some everyday signs of what's happening. Um, and so uh, let's look for some of those economic signs of, of what we'll expect to see. Uh, the first will be that average people who are already climbing uh, a steep financial slope will have to run a little faster to maintain a standard of living. The average person is going to have a choice. You either work harder or you become poorer. Inflation is the major feature of financial repression. And the major point of repression is that uh, the people with most of the wealth, who are the middle class, they're going to be the ones to pay for that inflation one way or another. At today's CPI inflation of 6.5%, it takes about 11 years for the purchasing power of your savings to be cut in half. And 11 years is only about one-fourth of a person's working work, working years. In other words, over the duration of a person's working life uh, at a 6.5% annual loss of purchasing power, you know, your earnings power, your earnings would be cut in half at least four times. So the question is, can real wages catch up to the rising prices? Well, they'll lag. Uh, it's not likely they'll catch up during a financial repression. As we see in this chart, uh, real wages have been lagging uh, inflation for, uh, they've been declining. In other words, wages in, adjusted for inflation have been declining for almost two years now. Um, According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, based on the CPI report of February 14th, consumer price inflation appears to have peaked and it's likely to come down some more and it probably won't stay at its current rate of six or six and a half percent. Recall that the Fed insists it's gonna bring annual consumer price increases down to 2%. I suspect they're eventually gonna change that goal, meaning that the rate of acceptable CPI inflation will increase from 2% to something higher, uh, it'll be high enough to eat into your savings in a world of low interest rates. And as you can see from this Bloomberg data here on this chart, average wages adjusted for the cost of living have been declining. Now, I want to offer uh, another example to illustrate what this financial repression looks like other than declining real wages. You cannot really capture the experience of financial repression the, uh, the, its effect on the average person by just looking at government data. And that's because economists who calculate, you know, CPI, core CPI, CPE, and or PCE, and all the other data the Fed uses to control short-term rates, economists and people think differently. I mean, the average person doesn't care about CPI data. I mean, she or he cares about putting good food on the table, paying for a decent home, driving a decent car and getting good health care. The CPI numbers might tell us that costs are going down or up because of the way that they're calculated. Uh, for example, CPI numbers tell you over time that because of technological progress, the quality of health care that you get today or the quality of the car you drive today is so much better than what you would have gotten in 1985. You know, and it probably is. But then they, they adjust the cost uh, the the uh, cost calculators adjust the cost to adjust for quality, claiming that you're now getting more money, more for your money today than you did in the past, and therefore they they discuss they they calculate a real cost lower than the actual money that you pay. And the problem is that in calculating in price inflation in this way, uh, the government uses techniques called hedonic adjustments and substitution effects that don't capture what a family is really spending on the necessities of life. Those periodic adjustments are always designed to make the inflation numbers look better than they really are. I saw a recent analysis in Grant's Interest Rate Observer, 
that over its history of calculating price indexes, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has adjusted its official calculation methods for inflation no less than 25 times. Guess how many of those adjustments resulted in an upward adjustment to the cost of living? How many? Zero. In other words, they always make inflation look more benign uh, than it really is. So I, as, as an exact measure of uh, the, you know, the effect on you, I, don't, I do not trust those inflation measures. But I think there's a better kind of a measure. Uh, it's called a, a better kind of cost of living me measure. It's one calculated by a nonprofit organization called American Compass that looks through those, those uh, BLS, BLS data by computing what they call a cost of thriving index or COTI. What they do is first they identify a specific set of goods and services that a typical household needs, like a typical basket of good food as established by the Department of Agriculture, a monthly rent for a just below average three bedroom house in a moderately priced housing market. Uh, a family health insurance plan of the type provided by an employer, driving a car 15,000 miles a year, and saving enough to fund enrollment in a public college for two children. Now, in my view, those are not really highly aspirational living standards for people living in the United States of America. I mean, those are really basic needs. You need to buy these things based on what they cost in the dollars you earn, not based on the index price calculated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Now, maybe some, sometime in the future, I'll explain some of those price adjustments to illustrate to you how deceptive they are. But, but this kind of measurement, the COTI, is, is, I think, especially relevant to our present discussion because it identifies costs that fall squarely on the middle class. That's the same group that bears the brunt of financial repression. Now, remember, the middle class is where the wealth is, so that is where the government has to look to find the wealth to pay down the public debt. Okay, so look at this chart now. Based on, the, on this COTI, the Cost of Thriving Index, starting from 1985, here's what the plight of the middle class looks like. Here's what you know, financial repression looks like uh, in, in graphic form. The red line is the average income for this cohort for the middle class. You can see that back in 1985, well, look, the, then, the, then the colored bands are the uh, income required for food, housing, healthcare, transportation, and education, okay? Uh, you can see that back in 1985, a middle class family could afford the basics uh, and still have a little left over. The red line is above all those bands. That's on the left. Uh, but that started to change in the mid-1990s, and then you can see that the gap between expenses and income just keeps widening. What I really uh, like about this analysis is that it quantifies something that virtually everyone already knows, namely that the middle class at, middle class at best is already swimming harder just to keep up with the opposing current. Um, now, the actual index here, which I don't show, is calculated by dividing the cost of a middle class lifestyle by the average weekly earnings of the middle class. So the result of that is the number of weeks in a year that it takes to earn that lifestyle. So here in California, where I speak from today, that number is 73 weeks. That's the second highest cost of thriving in the country, the highest being in West Virginia at 79 weeks. Now, I don't have to remind you that there are only 52 weeks in a year. So put another way, uh, the average middle-class family in California would have to earn 40% more income each year to purchase the basic lifestyle. And now this, this, this calculation gives you a big clue as to why so many middle-class Californians are migrating to Florida and Texas. Uh, this problem is not gonna go away. It, it's likely to get worse under increasing financial repression. Uh, so you may have to increase your savings rate, save a little harder, work a little harder in order to accum accumulate cash for investment. Now I could offer more examples, many more examples of financial conditions under financial repression, but I wanna offer just one more. 
Recall, please, that a key feature of repression is that government takes more in taxes by inflating nominal GDP, giving them more nominal income uh, dollars to tax. But the higher taxes don't just take away a higher number of inflated dollars. Income taxes actually take more real wealth from you through a phenomenon called bracket creep, which I now want to illustrate. I worked up a little example here. So let's imagine a household that earns $150,000 a year. And let's assume a progressive tax schedule very similar to what actually exists, but, but I've simplified it a bit to make the calculations easier. So in my example, we assume the first $50,000 of household earnings is taxed at 15%. The next $50,000 is taxed at 25%. The third $50,000 is taxed at 35%, and any income above $150,000 is taxed at 40%. That's called a progressive tax schedule, and it's fairly close to how today's real tax schedule works. The concept is as you earn more, you have to give up more of your incremental earnings and in taxes. Okay, next, let's add inflation to the mix and assume household income grows at 10% a year for 10 years. And along with that, uh, the cost of goods and services grows equally at 10%. So if there were no taxes, we assume a rosy scenario in which your top line income, your gross income, and so forth would just keep up with the, with the increasing cost of living. By the way, we just said before, that's probably not the case. But as we'll see, bracket creep does its own damage by taking more of your real wealth. So in this hypo hypothetical example, your gross income, that's the blue line on the top, grows from $150,000 in year one to $354,000 in year 10, giving you right there an, an, an illusion of prosperity. But because of tax bracket creep, meaning that as you earn more dollars, more dollars are being taxed at higher rates, your rising nominal income is pushed into higher tax brackets. So over 10 years, your overall tax rate uh, goes from 25% to 33%. Or put another way, your take-home pay after tax as a percentage of your gross before tax income goes from 75% down to 66%. That is why the orange line in the middle rises more slowly than the blue line. Now, finally, and most importantly, your real income, your take-home pay adjusted for annual price inflation, actually declines, going from $113,000 in year one to about $100,000 inflation adjusted dollars uh, in year 10. Now, I hope that's clear. That is the treadmill of financial repression. You work harder as the government takes more of your time and your talent to pay for its open-ended obligations. Please understand, this is exactly how it's supposed to work. From you know, financial repressions point of view. Now, there may be other tax increases and other fees under repression. You know, state taxes may go up. Uh, you can expect to see uh, less for your tax dollars. In other words, don't expect government services to get any better. You might have to learn to circumvent government agencies just to live well. For example, government health care is getting more expensive and the options within the government programs are getting pretty narrow. In the USA, we're still we're still going to have 100 million people on Medicaid. That's you know a huge. That's a quarter of the population. As your costs grow, it's more than that. As your costs grow and choices for medical services narrow, you're going to need to be nimble enough uh, to seek out your own supplementary private health care in order in order to stay really healthy. And that's another example of financial repression sort of in, in stealth form. So I, I hope you're starting to see through some of these examples how this combination of inflation and low interest rates transfers the wealth that you produce into higher tax revenue to allow the government to pay their debts down at lower real cost to them. And the low rates allows the government to give back less in interest to savers and to investors. So you're literally gonna be paying down government debt with your time and your talent. Now you cannot avoid this predicament entirely, but you know, with hard work and perseverance and diligence, uh, you can 
maintain your uh, independence and your independent standard uh, despite the government's unrelenting attempts to relieve you of your wealth. But you have to re recognize this new investment landscape before you can fight back. All right, so what will be some other features of this financial repression landscape? Let me check my time here. Okay, we're good. Um, there, there's several related social and financial elements that I'd like to mention. One is you're likely going to see political unrest resulting from the uh, strain on government uh, uh, distributions, on government uh, program, uh, you know, uh, transfer programs. Uh, these mass protests in France in, in January were, were, as an example, a reaction to the proposal that uh, France would raise its retirement age by two years, from 62 to 64, which already seems a little generous. But this, this caused massive uh, protests in many cities. So I think you'll likely see continuing and, and possibly growing political division, unrest, protests, and so forth. This is what we saw in the 1970s and early 80s. Uh, crime may become, a, it, or it is a problem. It, it could be a growing problem that you'll have to deal with personally. And you also might see sort of populist third party candidates become more common. Uh, additionally, I think you should expect a gradually declining use of the dollar in international trade. This is another part of the investment landscape. Uh, that, that's going to affect everyone, though it will affect many people indirectly and it'll be hard to see. Over the years, uh, U.S. sanctions against uh, uh, other countries are growing as an alternative to, to uh, physical conflict. And uh, that's, that's based on the assumption that, that the dollar is always going to be king. And uh, without our politicians appreciating what made the dollar strong in the first place. Uh, and this shift away from the dollar will be subtle and might be Im imperceptible to a lot of people, and it will move slowly. It won't be an abandonment of the dollar, but a gradual shift toward alternative reserve currencies, uh, and it'll have implications. Now, I want to illustrate this by pointing out what the effect of financial repression on our, our trading partners is. So uh, in the U.S., we run up our debt. We pay it off with cheap dollars. Then we repress interest rates. and uh, you know, if you are an oil exporter like Saudi Arabia or Russia, uh, that is, if you sell oil to the rest, you know, you sell oil to the rest of the world and you get paid in dollars, you build up a surplus of dollars, which you then store by investing in U.S. treasuries. Your treasury bonds earn, you know, let's say three or four percent in an inflationary world where the price of oil is going up at eight percent. Now, how long are you going to allow your savings to decline like that in real terms? You'd be, you'd be better off leaving your oil in the ground, wouldn't you? Because you're pretty sure its price is going to gradually rise higher, faster than interest rates will you know, uh, compound your dollars. So this is an example of what low real interest rates do to energy exporters like Russia and Saudi Arabia, Arabia who have, have held their trade surpluses in U.S. treasuries. Their choice is either to leave their oil in the ground or invest their trading profits in something besides dollars. So this is in addition to the fact that the U.S. just froze many Russian bank assets and has done it to many other countries, preventing them from uh, cashing in their reserve holdings of U.S. treasuries. Uh, in Russia's case, it was to the tune of about $650 billion. And I wrote about that uh, a little less than a year ago. Uh, so you can see why there might be a tendency for our trading partners to diversify away from dollar-denominated investments, which means moving away from treasuries, which means fewer buyers for treasuries, which puts more upward pressure on interest rates. So uh, by changing, with the changing or reduced international trade uh, that we're going to see, we're seeing, and we're going to see more, I think we're going to see a reshoring of some industries less globalization, less availability of, of cheap imported consumer goods, more upward pressure on consumer prices as you know money supply continues to grow, uh, you know more money chasing fewer imported goods. 
Uh, your overseas investment options also might be restricted due to capital controls and, uh, and uh, new fiduciary requirements that require you to invest a certain amount you know, at home. Uh, as an example of that, it's already almost impossible to invest in Russian assets if you're an American. I mean, it's already been closed off. So anyway, to summarize the main features of, of the financial repression landscape, moderate to high price inflation, low real interest rates, slow or, neg slow or negative growth in wages when adjusted for the rising cost of living, a greater portion of your real wealth being taxed away, social unrest associated with the government's uh, inability to keep its promises fully, a tendency toward deglobalization of trade, a reshoring of some industries, uh, as you know, lots of lots of things that are made abroad are coming back home, will come back home. More reliance on regional international trading blocks as opposed to global international trading blocks as trading partners shift, and continued international tensions and incremental moves away from the dollar. Those are some of the, the changing features in the investment landscape that I anticipate are gonna come, okay? All right, now this is probably a good place to pause for questions or comments. Uh, Daniel, have we got, what have we got? We have a super chat from Jeff, thank you so much, for five Canadian dollar, he says, keep it up. And okay. a question from Free Trade from 50 Swedish Krona, thank you so much, he's asking, since government creates bubbles in assets that are actually useless, and he says, for example, wind turbines, how do you feel about investing in this in this type of asset? Um, I'm going to talk about exactly that in a minute, but in general, let me just say, anticipate by saying, I avoid those if they're not real, if I don't think they're real. I can be wrong. If you invest in an artificial bubble, you are speculating. You never know when the stimulus that created that bubble will uh, burst. And that's especially true on direct subsidies like to windmills. In addition, it doesn't serve a real economic pur purpose. So you have to be, you have to ride the wave at the right time. Usually that goes to the big money first. Uh, you know, even with a lot of experience, I don't feel I can catch those waves. So my, my preference is avoid them. There's so many other opportunities. That's a great question. Those are all the questions so far. Okay, well, thanks everybody. All right, so uh, let's narrow the field now a little bit and talk about, uh, you know, having described the landscape, uh, what, what kind of investment options can we now identify as, as our, that are not great places to look for a return? I mean, you don't want to fish in muddy waters, right? So where are the muddy waters that we should avoid? That's one way to look at this. In other words, it's, it's a, you know, to save us time and trouble, let's think of where we do not want to spend a lot of time searching for good places to put our savings. So first, I would say, look at yourself and avoid areas where you lack knowledge or lack interest. Instead, concentrate on areas that you know about or are interested in. Uh, I would avoid areas that are not in your lane of expertise or interest. For example, don't get into options trading unless you are committed to really researching and understand what you're doing. On the other hand, this is just an example. If you have a real interest in luxury real estate, work to really understand that market and look for investment opportunities there. Uh, if you work in the defense industry, for example, you might be in good shape to understand opportunities there. Uh, now, it's always an advantage to start from a premise of real knowledge. And I'm going to use one of my own children as an example. Not bragging, this is just somebody I happen to know very well. It's my oldest son, who's still very young, is a construction engineer. He's currently building data centers under contract for a big tech firm. He's in a position to know that this tech firm is committed long term to building these uh, data centers in that particular area. He knows what they plan to build, how long they're going to be there. And he also knows from experience that rents in these areas are very high 
relative to the sales prices of their homes. And the development of these uh, data centers is increasing the, the demand. Now there's low housing supply and high rental demand. It looks like it'll last a long time. So he's investing in that local area by buying a house that he plans to rent to the construction workers who move in and out. I suspect this is gonna work out pretty well for him uh, for the foreseeable future. It is not sexy, but it's smart in my view. And he's taking control of his financial future despite financial repression. So that's an illustration of point one, avoid areas where you don't have the knowledge, but instead look for opportunities in your own backyard, so to speak. Okay, a second uh, recommendation of what to avoid is avoid, and this is a particular one, avoid long-term bonds, in my opinion. Uh, given the nature of uh, you know, the bond market and the nature of financial repression, I think you should avoid this area. Here's an excellent chart from Bianco Research showing the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury or its equivalent going all the way back to 1787. The vertical shaded areas indicate uh, recessions or depressions. Now, the first thing you notice that I noticed is that these yields move up and down in long multi-decade waves, right? Now, why they do that is a bit of a puzzle to me, but the fact that interest rates do move in long trends is historically unmistakable. The latest wave, which is a big downward move, if I can find my mouse from here, about 19, early 1980 down to uh, 2020, uh, is lasted you know, about 40 years. And, uh, but I believe that trend changed from downward to upward when we reached the lowest interest rates in five, whoops, in 5,000 years of recorded history uh, in, in March of 2020, the lowest in interest rates in the world in 5,000 years of recorded history. I hope you heard that. Um, remember that as yields declined during this 40 year period, uh, existing bond prices went way up, making a fortune for those who had bought the bonds when the yields were higher. Now we've got several uh, generations of investors who grew up in this environment, and likely they have this bias built into their investment habits which may not work in the future. I don't, I don't see how it can. But uh, yeah, I believe these days of falling interest rates are, are past and the trend of yields is now gonna be upward. And that's just one good reason to avoid long-term bonds in my view, in my view. But whether I'm right about that or not, perhaps there's a, a other reasons and perhaps better reasons to avoid long-term bonds. And the main one is that in an era of financial repression, interest rates may rise, but they're not gonna be allowed to rise enough to get above the annual rate of price increases. So even if you hold bonds for the long term, rates won't be high enough to give you a rate of return that beats inflation. So uh, I would also consider avoiding other investments that mimic or depend on the return on long-term bonds. For example, you should probably avoid equity investments in life insurance companies. And that's because life companies estimate their future payouts based on current interest rates, and they buy long-term bonds to match assets with expected payouts. So as rates rise, their liabilities rise, but, as, but the value of their long-term investments decline, and so they can quickly become insolvent in a, in a period like this. Now, 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 I'm suggesting avoiding life insurance companies as investments not necessarily property and casualty insurances, insurance companies, which are quite a different animal and which might do just fine, depending on the company. So no doubt, some people are going to make good positive returns in long-term bonds, no matter what happens. But those people will be expert bond traders. So my question is, is that you? You know, Go for it if you want, if you want to become an expert in trading bonds, but I, my belief is it's likely going to have to be a full-time occupation. All right. Uh, third, avoid, third thing to avoid. Avoid passive investing in the stock market. This will be probably the most controversial thing I say today. Another area I would avoid is the passive kind of broad index investing that's become so popular over the last 20 years. It's likely that some of you have a 401k invested in a fund that, that mimics the return on the S&P 500 or some broad index like that. That's been a great investment for 20 years. 
And it's been hard to beat the indexes by active investing, by stock picking. So let's discuss for a minute why it's been so easy to invest in the broad stock market uh, for so many uh, and, and why that's likely to change. So for the last 25 years, one of your best options has been simply to buy a fund you know, that mimics the broad index and, and just keep adding to it. Uh, you've had frightening setbacks like the dot-com crash of 2002 and the great financial crisis of 2008, and then the lockdown panic of 2020, but it always paid to stay invested in the index and keeping, you know, keep adding to your savings and keep refinancing your house because at every downturn, central banks responded with more liquidity and lower interest rates to keep the credit wheel turning. And that fed the market. Investors learned that assets only go up in the long run. That's what they learned. Companies that would normally have failed were kept alive by easy credit. And we've talked about those kinds of zombie companies. The difference, therefore, between sound companies and zombie companies was not reflected by extreme differences in valuations, as had been the case in the past. The easy credit conditions and declining interest rates undermined the normal creative destruction of capitalism. As people just bought the entire index, stock prices became more correlated with each other, meaning they tended to move up and down together more than they had in the past. So traditional value investing, which says you should purchase companies that are historically cheap relative to the rest of the market, or companies with a conservative balance sheet uh, that could weather an economic downturn, that became unpopular. So there were other factor, factors that added to this tendency toward sort of homogeneous uh, valuation. Some central banks, like the Japanese Central Bank and the Swiss National Bank, actively purchased large pools of stocks or, uh, or stock funds with newly created money, by the way, adding to the upward pressure on the broad indexes. Now, I wrote about this in the Objective Standard and on LinkedIn back in 2015, and you can look that up if you want. Uh, it's, a, it's about uh, central banks go beyond the, the fascist frontier, I think is what I called it. In addition, low interest rates pushed traditional savers into index funds because traditional saving and short-term rates didn't do any good. Now, this worked for a long time. Under those conditions, passive investing became a no-brainer, uh, an effective, very popular one-way ticket to becoming pretty rich. Slogans like TINA, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative to stocks, became pretty popular. Get in the market, stay in the market, buy stocks for the long run, buy the dip. Those are all concrete expressions of, of uh, an older investment landscape that is now changing. Uh, now, like geological landscapes, investment landscapes change slowly. I've said that. I, start, I suggest we're starting to see a, a shift away from the sort of automatic pilot mode of index investing. It's not going to go away entirely but we're entering an area where passive index investing may not be the world beater that it was in the past. Um, a recent Financial Times article by a very wise and influential investor, Mohammed El Aryan, sums this up pretty succinctly, and I want to quote in part. He says, passive, passive investing is particularly attractive in a world where investment outcomes are heavily influenced by a common global factor. This was the case for more than a decade as the combination of artificially floored interest rates and massive injections of central bank liquidity boosted all assets. Even zombie companies and fragile sovereign debt could, re could be refinanced without much difficulty. So then Elarian goes on to explain that the common global factors of low CPI inflation and low interest rates are now shaken, requiring central banks to raise interest rates, restrict money creation, and so forth. And in addition, uh, globalization is declining due to rising political tensions. And with, and with this comes a shift in how and where goods are manufactured and transported, and that raises costs. And those changing conditions create new investment opportunities while closing off old ones. Now, I agree with this assessment whole, wholeheartedly. Um, and he goes on, one more quote. In short, this is an investment world in which greater selectivity, smart structuring, and dynamic asset allocation, dynamic means changing course in anticipation of new information, trump more often the lower fees on passive vehicles. It's a world that warrants a partial return to a la carte selection after many years of fixed menus. Now, just to illustrate 
that index returns are not always a, the key to wealth accumulation. Here's some data from a 16-year-long uh, 16 16 year inflationary period that I think may prove to be similar to the area that we are, era that we're now entering. The chart uh, here shows the real return on various classes of stock market investments uh, along with corporate and government bonds. You can see small company stocks, mid-cap value stocks, large-cap value stocks were all the clear winners. Uh, bonds were a disaster, barely beating cash. Returns under the current financial repression won't be exactly like this for sure because history rarely repeats, you know, it just rhymes. But I offer this data to illustrate uh, uh, that buying and holding an index, as many people have done successfully in the last 20 years, may not work as well in the recent past. Um, okay, so we need to narrow the field of value candidates by uh, spotting opportunistic trends and avoiding risky trends. So value investing is generally uh, bottom-up investing that looks mainly at the company's fundamentals and financial performance as, uh, as a good but not the only indicator of what it's going to do in the future. Value investing pays less attention to momentum or speculative factors, and it simply asks what a company is reasonably worth in terms of pricing its cash flows. What's it worth to the investor? And then attempting to buy that cash flow stream at a discount to its fair value when the market gives you that opportunity. Now, one way to think of value stocks is if you were buying a company, one company to feed your family you know, after you're gone, what would that company be? And there are many such companies. Can I consider myself a value investor? And I personally like to say uh, I manage risk from the top down, but I invest from the bottom up. For example, looking from the top down, I avoid investing in Chinese companies because geopolitical tensions make them risky, even though they might look cheap from the bottom up. On the other hand, I look at uh, pretty hard at fairly priced companies that fit a positive top-down trend, like income-producing real estate benefiting from the migration of uh, from dense coastal urban areas out to the suburbs of the country. From the bottom-up perspective, uh, I might assess that the companies in that category are priced too high right now, so I'll wait till I reach a fair price, but at least, at least I've identified a universe where I can look at the future. Now, I want to give you a few uh, examples of how to look for an important trend. Uh, this story in Zero Hedge, and it relates to the question we just got, highlights the pressure on European banks to stop lending to fossil fuel companies, a trend that I've been aware of for some time. Now, what does this trend tell me? It tells me that funding for fossil fuels uh, companies is lagging. And the ideology, at least from the banks, and, uh, and that the ideological uh, bias against fossil fuels is one reason there's such underinvestment today in oil and gas. If, if these ESG-oriented asset managers have their way, new money creation will not go from European banks into new fossil fuel companies. So think of the implications of that policy and ask where it leads you. I'll tell you where it leads me. To me, it does not lead me to invest in carbon capture, windmills, solar panels, or anything related to these forms of energy, which I know are mostly uneconomic and unreliable. Uh, the, the, the real economic demand for those energy sources, those, those uh, so-called uh, renewables, is limited, it's inflated by subsidies, it's hyped by top politics, and it's hyped by global warming hysteria. The big money from investing in those, in those things has come and gone and is ironically not sustainable anymore. On the other hand, <clears throat> as events in Europe and, and prices, uh, energy prices have shown, uh, and, as, and, and as actual science shows, I know that fossil fuels and nuclear te technology have to grow because they're going to be absolutely necessary to propel civilization as far as my eyes can see. And I know that investment investing uh, investment in those sources of energy has been well below average for almost a decade, even longer in the case of uh, nuclear power. So this prompts me to ask, what does that mean for this trend of, of prices in oil and gas? 
Where will the investment in oil and gas come from? What has to happen to unleash investment in nuclear power? Who benefits from this anti-fossil fuel bias and who loses? And in my case, seeing this trend unfold has led me to invest in oil and gas and coal-related stocks, which were depressed for years and which also fit my bottom-up value investing criteria. This is a case where you ignore the hyped narrative and look at the facts. And so I offer this as an example of what you should do, not, not exactly what you should do, but how a trend can uh, that you spot can spawn a, 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 an important investment idea, all right? All right, now here's, I'm going to give you another example. I'm probably going to run out of time here, um, but I'm going to give you another example of a negative trend that could generate investment ideas, just to let you know that these ideas are everywhere. Let me ask, what's the future of office real estate in metropolitan areas post-pandemic? The creator of this chart is a company called Castle Systems. It's a maker of office security products. They monitor key card swipes uh, among their customers so that they know the usage and the occupancy of their customers' buildings. Uh, this data is all publicly available to anyone. And this chart assumes an index of 100%, of 100 occupancy index of 100% way up here at the beginning, pre-pandemic. See there in the upper left? OK. Three years later, we're only back to less than 50% occupancy uh, of city office space. I mean, everyone left the office and they're working from home. Philadelphia and San Francisco are only back to 40% occupancy and the best areas like Houston and Austin are only back to 60%. Are, and I ask you, are we ever gonna go back to 100%? I would say not in any reasonable investment horizon. This was a, uh, a trend already underway, but uh, vastly accelerated by the pandemic. So this trend might tell you that even if office space related office space related investments look very cheap by historical standards, you should be very careful before jumping in. I mean, on the other hand, maybe someone can buy an office property out of bankruptcy and wants to convert it into a badly needed living space, you know. Uh, or, or I don't know, prison or something, that might work. Uh, but in any case, be careful and understand the underlying trend. There's, uh, I'm going to skip over some other examples I've had. You know, you've got reshoring. Uh, pretty clearly, we're going to be relying less on China in the future to make our consumer goods. So we're going to have to bring investments home. Uh, you know, we're going to have to start making stuff more at home or in with different trading partners. Those investments will have to be made. That will, you can, if you find them, you can invest alongside and uh, you can do well. Um, another trend you might exploit the global population is aging. Uh, so, on average, that means slower growth in the uh, consumption of consumer goods. However, countries like India and Bangladesh and Pakistan and Ethiopia have very youthful demographics. So the demand for goods in those countries will grow. Um, they might in, represent some very good investment opportunities from a demographic point of view, but they also come with issues that need to be tackled first. Like you know, they got to have infra infrastructure before they can produce. But anyway, those are examples of the, again not to, designed to tell you where to look, but how to look. You might narrow the field by using your own knowledge or imagination to think of some other trends uh, that, you know, that might work out despite financial repression. So uh, just some other positive ideas in general. First, I think active investing is back and value investing is a good active strategy. And um, I'm going to start going very fast now because I'm going to run out of time. But uh, you know, in the stock market where I basically make my living, I've always used the investment practices laid out by the great Benjamin Graham and made famous by Warren Buffett. And stocks are definitely not for everyone. There's good ways to save and invest without the stock market. But if, if you're going to get actively involved in the stock market, uh, to educate yourself, I would start with Benjamin Graham's books. This one in particular is a good start. 
And then read Warren Buffett's annual letters to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders, which are readily available for, for free in ebook form. And if, as you read these, you don't find them interesting, I would steer clear of the stock market. Because if you're not interested, don't force yourself into stocks due to fear of missing out. If you're not interested, it's not for you. All right. Um, now, value investing or old-fashioned stock picking based on company fundamentals has been so out of favor recently that one of its greatest uh, practitioners, a guy named David Einhorn from Greenlight Capital, recently said in an interview that fundamental stock picking might be dead. Now, I think Einhorn, who I, I respect a lot, who was only partly right about this, uh, you know, to paraphrase Mark Twain, the death of value investing has been greatly exaggerated. Value, in, value investing never really died. It just kind of went into hibernation for a couple of decades. I'll probably have a lot more to say about value investing in future chats because I believe this old-fashioned basic approach never goes out of style. It'll work well in the future. And frankly, it's something uh, I'm very familiar with. I'm not offering investment advice here. But if, I, but, if, but if I could offer one little aphorism to sum up my whole attitude toward investing in stocks, it would be this, this. In the stock market, the opportunity of a lifetime comes along about every three months. Now, I don't know who said that. I heard it somewhere, and I can't, I, I can't find who said that. I wish I'd said that. Uh, I heard this before I actually learned it, and it's true. This means that patience, uh, buying businesses and not stocks, you know, hard work, study, not speculation, resisting the FOMO urges and shutting out the noise. That's what value investing is. All right. So before I wrap up today's chat, um, let's continue with one final Look at, at Mohammed El Arian's theme that you should pick from an a la carte menu of investing ideas rather than the fixed price menu. Uh, I'd like to offer you now a partial menu of investments that should do okay under financial repression investment classes. And this is not a comprehensive look by any means, but it's a list of the types of you know dishes that you can choose from. The analogy is more like I recommend you eat more beef and less corn but I'm not tell, gonna tell you where to buy your beef or how to cook it, okay? I'm gonna offer four general recommendations. Uh, first recommendation one, uh, make your cash work as hard as you can make it work. Check my, sorry folks, let me check my time here. I don't wanna run Daniel over. Okay, I'll just have Daniel cut me off when he has to. Make your cash work as hard as you can. Uh, if you have extra money sitting in a bank deposit or a brokerage account, you're probably getting less than 1% annual interest on that money. For years, you haven't had to care about this because consumer price inflation was low, but now it's at least 6%. So don't settle for bank deposit yields. You can buy brokered three-month CDs at 4.5%. The six-month treasury note's about the same. Both are virtually risk-free and can be easily sold even before their short maturity period. Now you won't beat inflation with this strategy, but you'll limit its damage. So make your cash sweat. It, it, it adds up over, over time. Okay, recommendation two, own your own home. Doesn't mean run out and buy a house now, but that should be an objective in, for most people in my opinion. Owning a home is the best long-term investment most people ever make. In the USA, there's tax advantages like the deductibility of mortgage interest that makes it attractive. Be careful, don't just run out and buy something. Shop for the best areas, be patient, use time as your diversifier. Be concerned with fair prices, uh, more than mortgage rates. That's more important than mortgage rates because you can't control mortgage rates. But it, you know, if they go up after you buy, you got a good deal, but if they go down, you can always refinance to your advantage. The, the, the trend from the cities to the country, uh, to the suburbs, uh, is, is working in your favor. You might even consider making home ownership your main investment theme, your first main investment theme. 
Many people, uh, like an example I just mentioned, buy homes as rental real estate, and they do very well over the years. Uh, this requires work, but if you like doing it, it can be very rewarding. So take advantage of the chronic, sh chronic shortage of housing and you know, own a home. Uh, one huge advantage of uh, home ownership in the USA, <clears throat> at least, is that your home is a secure property right. Property rights are under assault today, but the family home is such an important American icon and such a strong traditional value that I, I suspect it'll be one of the last place, probably, that government will, will, will come to try to pillage your wealth. Many states have protections against bankruptcy, uh, you know, on home ownership, like homestead laws. You're well protected. Your investment is well protected in terms of property rights if you own a home. Okay, recommendation three, if you invest in stocks, buy good businesses for the long run. And I just want to give one example of a lifetime opportunity. This is Walmart stock. I offer this as one great example. And there are and were many like this. Uh, this is a 50-year chart of Walmart stock. The stock price was 3.8 cents adjusted for splits and stock dividends 50 years ago. That's 1972. 50 years later, it's worth $145 a share. $1,000 invested 50 years ago in Walmart stock is worth 3.8 million today. That doesn't even include the dividends, which could have been reinvested. Now, some companies like Walmart do have dividend reinvestment investment plans called DRIP, DRIPS, Dividend Reinvestment Plans, that allow the company to hold your shares and reinvest the dividends for you. So you can buy a good company and practically forget about it. Uh, it's also a good way to save uh, for college for your kids. Now, I was not wealthy in 1972, but I did have $1,000 to invest. No, I did not buy and hold Walmart. Uh, I don't harbor regrets about it. But the point is that you will be uh, presented with many opportunities like this in your investing lifetime. The only question is, will you, will you be able to uh, see them? Uh, there's you know, many other considerations for investing in companies under inflation. And uh, rather than list those now, I'd like to talk about the, those in future podcasts. Okay, recommendation four, con consider traditional inflation beaters. One is farmland. Fertile farmland usually keeps its value during inflation because its value depends on the value and the price of the crops it produces. Uh, farmland's not very liquid. It might be hard to sell, but if you're patient, its value generally does well. Uh, timber land may, be, may you know, hold some of the same characteristics. Now, a whole working farm is expensive. Most people don't want to do farm work. So uh, you can invest directly in, in farmland through private partnerships or through publicly traded REITs. Be careful. They're long-term investments. Uh, don't pay big premiums or net asset values and so forth. But if it's available to you, you might consider farmland. And uh, then, of course, I'm going to end with precious metals as a traditional inflation beater. To me, gold is the savings asset of choice under financial repression. There's at least two reasons. Uh, first, real interest rates are negative, but gold doesn't pay a coupon, so it never goes negative. But it tends to perform with inflation, which is by definition better than the negative performance of long bonds under financial repression, you know, negative interest, negative real interest rates. Second, it's difficult for government to interfere with property rights of owning gold. Many central banks are buying it in size. Pensions are owning it. State governments are passing legal tender laws protecting gold and building uh, safe state-run depositories. Now, gold is not a, a security, so it's not going to be regulated by the SEC. In general, gold is the only financial asset that's not someone else's liability. There are, no, there are definitely risks with gold, but there is no counterparty risk. New supplies of gold increase only by about 1% or 2% a year. So it can't be severely inflated like fiat money. Um, so uh, I probably uh, want to close with uh, this quote from an economist I respect. Uh, some people like Bitcoin as a digital alternative to, to fiat currency, but 
I like this expression from uh, this Scottish professor. Gold is physical Bitcoin, says Russell Napier. That's a play on the expression. Bitcoin is physical gold. Um, now, of course, you can also buy gold miners and, and gold royalty companies, which I'll have more to say about in future podcasts. Okay, final recommendation. Find reliable advisors who make sense but do not make outlandish claims. Now, you have to pay for their honesty and objectivity, but you won't have to pay a lot of money. And I'm going to recommend some of these in the future. All right. I fear I have run over time. So let's draw a line here. Daniel, do we have time for any questions or comments? We have a super chat from D Dwayne for $5. Thank you so much. Also super chat from Jeff for 10 Canadian dollars. He says, off topic, Canadian equalization is entrenched in our constitution since 1982 by Pierre Trudeau. Do you know if other countries do this type of redistribution from half to have not provinces? All, um, I, I don't know the details of the redistribution uh, programs of Canada, but I'm pretty sure they are, all have a counterpart in the USA, in the UK, in all the EU countries. All countries do this. Uh, and it's an increasing, uh, creeping, increasing trend. So um, if I'm understanding the question right, do I, uh, do you do know I think? If, if other countries do this type of redistribution? I don't know. Maybe not exactly like Canada, but definitely they're redistributive. They're redistributed through tax, redistributed through uh, what used to be called welfare programs, redistributed through inflation, uh, uh, redistributed through government money printing that redistributes real wealth to the places where government wants it to go. It is rampant. And this is all part of financial repression. And uh, what I'm trying to do here is figure out, is help, help us figure out how we can prosper despite this uh, this right this gro growing trend <clears throat> thanks we for also, that question we also have a super chat from free trade thank you for 50 swedish krona he says excellent show jim lots of valuable points thanks well thank you for that comment um before i go i want to uh mention one thing uh i wrote a uh, in between last time last uh podcast and today i wrote a short piece which i just couldn't resist writing it's called Chat GPT, Artificial Intelligence for Authentic Ignorance. And uh, you can go read it. It's like a five minute read. I asked Chat GPT uh, to explain money creation. And Chat GPT flunked, got an F. And um, I thought it was interesting because uh, Chat GPT reflects the common knowledge, quote unquote, common knowledge, you know, what everybody knows that everybody knows, that's what chat GPT reflects. So to me, chat GPT is a good cultural bar barometer. Where you find ignorance on chat GPT, you find ignorance culture-wide. So um, take a look at that, uh, see what you think of it. And if you know some, if you're an expert in, if you if you're very knowledgeable in some area, ask ChatGPT a question about your area of knowledge, and see what it says. It's very interesting. All right, with that, thank you very much. Quickly, um, we also have yeah. a super chat from Rohit for five dollars. Thank you so much. And funnily enough, I tried to ask ChatGPT uh, about the source of the quote you mentioned. And he said, or it said, Sir John Templeton or Paul Tudor Jones or others. So there is no, at least ChatGPT doesn't know the actual doesn't know. origin. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I've seen many, I thought it was Warren Buffett too. I might as well say it's Jim Brown. No, it wasn't Jim Brown. If ChatGPT says that, you have to correct it because it wasn't me. I learned it early in my career. So John Templeton sounds... Uh, he's long gone, but he was quite a great uh, value investor and uh, actually met him one time. And he sounds like the kind of guy 
who, it, it, it's that sounds like something that would have come from John Templeton. But thanks for looking that up. Uh, that might narrow the field a little bit. Um, that's great. So those are all the super chat. <laughs> right. Thanks very much uh, for everybody for uh, listening. And uh, uh, if you haven't subscribed, you can subscribe for free to, to uh, Hard Money Gym on Substack. And uh, take care, and I will see you next time, probably two weeks from now.